All right, this is about 600 carats of clear quartz. It's not, not a very expensive piece of rough. And I bought it 20 years ago or more. Haven't ever used it, but I'm gonna, this is something uh, any fastener could, you know, if they want something inexpensive to cut with, I'd say try quartz. Some people, you know, don't, don't use uh, the old TV screens that some people have said to facet because that's high in lead content. You don't want to use that. But so here's something, if you want something really inexpensive, uh, cut this. So I'm going to take it to my trim saw and I'm going to trim a piece like that big and then cut it into manageable size pieces. And it'll still leave me a reserve of, what, 300 carats. So uh, let me cut this on our trim saw. Okay, this is my Ameritool trim saw and all I do is I put water in the reservoir till the water just touches the bottom of the blade. That'll help keep it smooth and I run it at full speed. So let me set my stone up and uh, go ahead and cut it. Okay, I'm just going to cut this piece of uh, quartz and of course always wear eye protection when you're working with a trim saw. And now I turned it over and I'm going to cut uh, the bottom part. It's a little, it's a thick stone, so. Okay, now I'll just clean up the uh, this flash tray, empty out the reservoir. The way you dry the blade is by uh, spin drying it, and uh, then we're done. We'll put the trim saw away for another day. Okay, for our clear quartz that we're going to cut a standard round brilliant, or two of them, I've got the stones uh, already trimmed, and... I've got the bottom dops that will go on the bottom part of the transfer jig. I'll put a piece of uh, modeling clay on the dop to, and hold the bottom part. I have an oversized top part, top dop, uh, to help me center the stone because that'll help because it's so big. You want that, that dop to be almost as big as the stone so it helps you really easily center. And then once I get it centered in the dop, I have the final, centered in the uh, transfer jig, I have the final dop that I will uh, swap out the temporary dop that I used to center with. And this is the dop we'll glue with two-part epoxy to the uh, quartz. Same with the other one. I have the bottom dop, the, the modeling clay that'll help mold to the bottom make it look a little bit flat so that the top part can be held flat the oversized top dot which will 
help me center it pretty easily about the same size as that stone and then after I get it centered in the transfer jig my final top that I'll be using and uh, it'll already be centered so we'll just uh, glue it with the two-part epoxy so we're all ready to uh, set our stones up for gluing them to the two-part epoxy we're going to be using Devcon two-part epoxy there's I've been using for the past year my JB weld it's now a year old I've used it for more than a year I mean I've used this product for more than a year but it's time to swap these out I marked I marked the month I got them and it's time to clear these out the one does change color after a period of time and gets a little bit uh, harder I don't know if that affects it or not I had no problems with JB Weld. It's a wonderful product available at uh, Home Depot. Just want to try the Defcon. A lot of a lot of uh, cutters like Defcon, and several complained that to me that they don't like. They're worried about the JB Weld because when it hardens, it still sits, stays kind of bendable. Like when you remove the epoxy from the stone after you've cut the stone it's it's it still kind of bends and they feel that that could let the stone slip i never had that problem so i never had a problem with the jb weld the stone slipping never and i used two bottles of this before a couple years worth of using it uh devcon is a little harder to get you have to order it not too hard you know amazon but but it's not as available but they say well i and I used it years and years ago that it when it hardens it hardens with no nothing malleable so it's the same process it's got two parts this one's already a different color whereas with the JB Weld they both started out the same color and then the hardener over time changed colors Not, not quite as dark as the Devcon, but the color doesn't matter. So I will give this a try for a while and see if there's any big difference between the two. Probably, probably not. And uh, if there is, I, I'll have two options to go to. So let me go ahead and get these stones set up in our transfer, in my transfer jigs. Okay, we've got our two pieces of quartz set up, and we use the oversized dots to center the stones where I want them in the dot for our standard round brilliant. Now I will remove the top two uh, dots and put in the actual dot we're going to use and then uh, use our Devcon um, epoxy for the first time. Okay I'm going to put the epoxy on the back of a business card with a bamboo skewer that I got from the grocery store to mix up the epoxy. Epoxy comes in two parts and once it's mixed together you have a little bit of time to uh, put it on the stone a couple of minutes before it starts hardening up. One part is a resin and the other part's a hardener. And they're, once they're mixed together is when they begin the hardening process. The uh, box has a uh, use-by date on it. More than plenty of time. I'll, I'll mark the bottles uh, and a year from now I will switch them out. And I just eyeball and make two big puddles of about how much epoxy I think I need. I did get a, a number of people commenting on different methods uh, that they use to, I guess, measure the epoxy before mixing it together so they get a 50-50 mix exactly. I don't do it. Again, eyeball it to make puddles about the same size is close enough. And just like with my previous bottles of JB Weld, these two bottles that I'm now going to retire, if you look, after using them for an entire year, uh, the hardener is here and the resin is here. I mean, guys, pretty darn close to a 50-50 mix just by eyeballing it and a few times where I got, looked more than, one got more than 50%, I just, you know, scooped a little bit off. So again, I've never had a problem eyeballing it. I'm not interested in any type of measuring device to pour the epoxy into and then pour it into the, to be mixed together. I just, I just don't think it's necessary. So let me mix these together and uh, we'll put the epoxy, uh, our new Devcon epoxy on the stones and see how that works out.
I'm going to do one stone at a time because after I put the epoxy on, uh, I do have to rotate the uh, transfer jig a few times until it sets. You want epoxy on both the stone and the dot. And then, like I said, you want to rotate the transfer jig a few times um, as gravity is doing its thing and the epoxy is uh, flowing. And you want to make sure the epoxy does not flow down the sides of the stone or too far down the dot. And that just takes a couple of minutes. And our second stone get a little bit of epoxy on the bottom. Some people don't put epoxy on the bottom of the dops. They push the dop down and just put epoxy all around it. Either way works. Whatever you like. I just want to put a little more epoxy a little way from up the dop all the way around. And let gravity do its what it will and we'll just keep flipping the transfer jig until uh, the epoxy sets up in just a couple of minutes then we'll let it set as I've got a couple of other stones to cut and by the time I'm finishing the other stones these will be ready to cut okay for our quartz the uh, Devcon epoxy is pretty much you know, not running anymore it's set up the way it is and I will note that the JB Weld makes a wider, it, it kind of makes a wider base where it reaches the stone from the top. I think the DevCon's a little more runny, so it, it, there's not that kind of V going from the glue with, on the stone up to the top. I don't like that. But keep an open mind, that's just kind of, this is just kind of the unboxing. Um, we'll see how it works, although, I don't know, JB, JB Weld never never really fell off the stone anyway, but uh, I'll give Debcon an honest try. I've got a year's supply of it. But initial initial unboxing first use, I like the JB Weld a little bit better. It's a little slower running, even when it's, you know, freshly put together than the, uh, the Debcon. But again, we will see We'll see what we see as we as I get used to using it. That may be just be because I'm just not used to it, but I did want to tell you that, that I, to me, there's a difference from the start. For this video, I will be cutting what I consider to be the best first design a new cutter should try to cut. It's called the Standard Round Brilliant, or SRB for short. I know that some Super Gem cut cutting instructors don't teach the standard round brilliant or srb as the first stone for their new cutters but that many other great instructors do teach the srb as the first stone for new cutters so if the srb isn't the first stone that a new cutter cuts i think we can all at least agree that it's one of the first stones that a new cutter learns to cut with the srb is the most common round design cut used for diamonds in the jewelry industry today and I want to use this design for our new cutters so they can see how to cut this design. And as a new cutter, you should focus on getting the meats of your facets to just touch the next row or tier or girdle of facets. Um, you need to develop that skill to get your meat points to meet as a new cutter. When I finish with these two gemstones, they should look like this from the top, side, and bottom. And here is the complete design I will be cutting with the cutting instructions. Don't worry if you don't understand some of the instructions and information here. I do explain all the information in gem cutting designs in a two-part video. So go take a look at those videos if you have any questions 
about the instructions in cutting this design. Now, as a new cutter working on your first or second gemstone, I do have a bit of bad news. Even though the SRB is the most common design used to cut diamonds in the jewelry trade, you will not be cutting a diamond with your gem cutting machine. I am only aware of one colored stone gem cutter who ever managed to cut and polish a diamond. That is Mr. Nick Michaelitis, who is one of the legends, definitely pioneers, in our gem cutting community. Nick, who is trained in diamond cutting, had to do two things before cutting and polishing a diamond. First, he had to create a new gem cutting machine, and second, he had to have a forge build him a special lap. Nick, about 35 or so years ago, uh, invented the Diamante gem cutting machine. Some of these machines, of which Nick built about a hundred, are still in use today and sometimes show up in the used fasting machine markets and they go for the neighborhood of, of $1,500 each if, if you can find one. What made Nick's Diamante capable of cutting diamonds was the high speed that these machines could operate at. The Diamante can, re can operate at 4,500 RPMs. Compared to the Altertech, which is an excellent gem cutting machine, which has a top speed of around 1,600 RPMs. The next thing Nick had to do was to get a lap that would work to cut and polish diamonds. So since Nick had been trained in the diamond industry, he asked one of his friends in the diamond cutting business for an old worn out diamond cutting lap, which Nick received. Nick then examined the lap, cut a sample, looked at the alloy, and uh, contacted his local foundry and found out they could produce a lap for his Diamante machine. Then with the right equipment, the Diamante, and the right lap, Nick Michaelitis did, in fact, cut and polish a diamond, which he then sent to his friend in the diamond business in New York to verify. But Nick didn't stop there. He also created a line of gem cutting machines called the Imperial, and then those evolved into the Alpha Taurus gem cutting machine. Uh, used Alpha Taurus machines still show up uh, for sale regularly in the secondhand market. And again, they sell for around uh, 1500, which is not bad for keeping its value as the new Alpha Taurus sold for around 2600 before Nick uh, retired. Well, not really retired. Nick is still around and cutting gems today. And, he will be celebrating his 92nd birthday in a few months. So happy birthday, Nick, and many, many more. One cool feature that the Alpha Taurus has is that it allows you to rotate the index teeth from the rear of the spindle, which saves a lot of production time because you don't have to lift the quill face towards you and adjust the teeth. And if you're cutting for profession, time is money. Although I am cutting clear quartz, which resembles a diamond, I am not cutting a diamond. I'll leave that to Nick and his Diamante machine. And I also want to thank Nick for contacting me about using uh, cerium oxide and other oxides. I was kind of pasting them, smearing them onto the lap as, I, as the way I was using them. And he showed me how to use a spray bottle instead of having to smear the oxide onto the lap. And I'll show you what Nick taught me later in this video. Okay, this is our second uh, piece of clear quartz that we're going to cut into our standard round brilliant design. So we begin preforming it with our 360 grit uh, topper lap. Okay, I finished pre preforming our clear quartz with a 320 topper, 320 grit diamond. Although there's probably no difference between a 320 and a 360, and I used my regular V5 Altertech with this one. So I cut the first, uh, preformed my first quartz with my old V2 just to see if it's uh, still working and it's been sitting in the closet since I got my V5. So the differences between, the basic differences between a V2 and a V5 are on the machine itself, on my machine there's no difference. It's the same power instructions, you know, counterclockwise, clockwise, just the speed dial on off, and another on off here, and another on off on the dial, because off is a setting. So just exact same, same setup, same drip tray setup, everything the same. 
My V2, I use a different water supply that I had bought from the late Jeff Graham back when I had my V2. There was a issue with the original water tanks from Ultratech, but they improved on them. And uh, with the V5, this, this water drip tank works just fine. Uh, so the drip tank's a little different and the, of course, the big difference is in the V5 is with a, this dad indicator of the angle. My V2 has a little manual, uh, not digital, but it works just as good. I preformed the uh, other first my first quartz with that. So the this part is all the same. That's the same. The handle is different. On the V5, it's a little. They made it a little bigger, which I guess makes it quicker to raise and lower slightly, although not much. And other than that, they're the same. So the, if you're buying or looking at a V2 or a V5, the main difference is this mast assembly and the DAD, the digital readout. If you want a digital readout, that's with the V5. Otherwise, it's a, a manual readout. Although I do have the uh, little blinking light electrical, I forget what they called it with the uh, V2, that as it gets closer, the light starts blinking faster and faster. And as it hits the angle, it's a solid light and a beep comes on. So that was the pre-dad Ultratech. So those are the differences between the V2 and the V5. Now I'll switch to a 600 grit topper and continue to preform or continue to facet our clear quartz. So our standard round brilliant on our quartz. I've uh, finished cutting it with the uh, 12M, which is equivalent of a 1500 grit uh, lap. And now I'll go over it with the 3000 grit diamond on a bat lap, and then we'll be ready to polish it. I think I'll try the tin lap with uh, for quartz uh, serum oxide to polish it and see how that works. But next is the uh, 3000 grit diamond. Okay, I finished polishing our pavilion using 14,000 grit diamond on a bat lap. And I focused on getting the meats just to hit, just to touch. So um, as, a new, as a new faster, you wanna make sure, focus on your meat points, take it slow and uh, and you'll be fine. So now I'll polish this. Okay, I finished polishing the bottom half or the pavilion of our quartz. And I changed the way I've done things. So this is the first time I've used the uh, cerium oxide in a spray bottle. So what I did is I took my, my cerium oxide, the powder, and I put uh, three, little, I guess, stick folds in uh, the spray bottle and then some water and it made a milky solution. And then how I used to rub it all with my finger, I just uh, got a slow rotation and just, uh, just spray the spray bottle. That did perfect, worked perfectly on my uh, uh, tin lap for polishing up this quartz. Like I said, it's the first time I've tried it. Uh, we'll see how it works out going forward. Now I'll change the uh, stone and transfer it in our transfer jig so that I can cut the top half of the crown. Okay, as our first quartz is in the transfer jig, letting the epoxy dry as we transferred from the uh, pavilion to the crown, our second quartz uh, is ready to go onto the into our Ultratech. So you look at the diagram for the girdle and which we cut when we cut the pavilion and there's flat spots at three, nine, 15, every six teeth of the index gear all the way around to 93. So you just go to uh, the index tooth of three and you want there to be a flat spot. So you set up your precision tool, precision flat square. This comes from Ultratech and this one I bought off of uh, Amazon. So 
uh, on your flattest disc and you put the dial indicator at 90 degrees and you run the stone down the mast until it just touches your precision flat tool and where it touches you make sure that the uh, that you've got a flat you've got that flat facet and if not you just uh, turn your stone in the alter tech and then you tighten it up by just tightening the set screw and then you're ready to start cutting and polishing finish polishing the uh, pavilion now I've cut the pavilion already to uh, 12m which is about a 3000 grit standard so I will I believe I will start with a 3000 uh, grit diamond on a bat lap um, I think I'm that far along if not I'll go back to the 12m Nick has explained that I should shake up the oxide water mixture and then count to 10 to let it settle a bit this allows any oversized pieces of oxide to sink to the bottom instead of potentially being sprayed onto the lap where they could scratch the stone. No matter how exacting the oxide micron size should be in the, in the batch you buy, there are always going to be some oversized pieces. So cutting the draw straw in my spray bottle a little bit back ensures that I won't be picking up any uh, oxide pieces off the bottom. Thanks, Nick. So I finished pre-polishing our pavilion on our second piece of quartz using 3000 grit diamond on the bat lap. And now I'll use tin and, uh, and my uh, cerium oxide spray that I'm working on. Okay, so we want to shake up our cerium oxide liquid. It all mixed and then we want to count to 10 that way the uh, any of the larger microns the heavier microns will sink to the bottom of our mixture and then we just spray and we're ready to polish our quartz Okay, when I start to hear kind of a, you can kind of hear it squealing a little bit, I just put another spritz of the uh, liquid on there. I don't shake it up because it's still, still pretty well mixed and the, any of the bigger pieces have already set at the bottom. I don't turn the machine off, I just give it another spritz and uh, go back to polishing. And that seems to be working out just fine. Okay, as I'm polishing the final row on the pavilion, it's the uh, P3 at 41 degrees. You can see that it's polishing most of the facet, but on this far side, this far left, uh, right side, not not polishing, which which is pretty common with when you get to your larger stones, and that's why the Altertech has the cheater. So the cheater, it's not called the cheater, but everybody calls it the cheater, is this here. It's just a micro adjustment of your dial. So we're at the 72 um, tooth. And we don't want to go to the 71 or the 73. That's way too far to make up for this minor adjustment. So you use the cheater. And the way you use it is I want to turn the stone clockwise to get that right, right part of it. So you turn the cheater the same way, right. And let's just go 0.1, which is a very small change. And that moves that moves the the tooth slightly clockwise. So it'd be like 71.9 something instead of the 72. Okay, now you can see that the uh, 
the facets uh, polished. It took care of the, uh, as you're looking at it, the right hand side. So the thing to remember about using your cheater is the, if you want to go, if you want to move the stone clockwise, you turn the, the cheater clockwise. If you want to go counterclockwise on stone, you turn the cheater counterclockwise. So turn the cheater the way you want the stone to go. Now I'll leave that cheater on point one for this tier and uh, only adjust it if I have a, a problem with another facet, but I think the whole row will, will come out the same way. So I'll leave that cheater on. Generally my experience is it works for the entire row. Okay, I finished polishing the bottom half of the pavilion of our clear quartz. And now I'll transfer it in the transfer jig and we'll be ready to cut the upper half or the crown of this stone. Okay, I've finished preforming the uh, crown of our first uh, clear quartz. I used toppers, uh, 240, uh, 360, and then uh, the 600 topper. Uh, toppers are thin. I put them on top of a, you need a base lap, so I use my ceramic. I would recommend toppers for new cutters who are on a budget. Spend most of your budget on getting the best machine you can. And then toppers are fine up to the 600 grit level. I would not use a topper beyond that. Uh, you need uh, better laps after the 600 level. So, um, in fact, the 200 level toppers, I probably wouldn't really recommend that much. Uh, I'd say you get a 300 something. They, they, they're all very good. 320, 340, 360. Anything in the 300 range. And I'd start with that and then go to the 600. The problem when you get down to a 200, uh, it can probably okay uh, on the stones, but when you get down to the 100 grit or they have a 60 grit lap, those cause um, substructure damage to your stone. You won't notice it until you cut off the upper layer and then you'll see all of a sudden a fracture, an inclusion that where you, there wasn't one. And that's because the uh, a rough, really rough lap will just uh, vibrate that stone and really cause damage. So definitely I would not use anything in the 100 range. I bought a 60 grit crystal light lap when I first started. On bad advice and have seen the damage that it can cause so uh, 240 toppers I, I use in 200 series but uh, more and more I think I probably won't go beyond a 300 level grit going forward so so the next step is my uh, 12m lap which is doing great it's like a uh, 1200 it's grit it's really a 1500 grit if there was such a thing but the M is microns, so it's 12 uh, microns. And then I'll go to the 3000 grit diamond on a bat lap and then uh, polish it with our tin lap and the, uh, and the little serum oxide in a bottle, which is working out great. So 12M is next. So I finished pre-polishing with the 12M lap which is doing really good. And it's, I want to try going straight to polish and skip the 3000 grit diamond on the bat lap with this quartz. Um, I have gone to polish from in the past with my 1200 grit crystal light, which I used to use. Now I've replaced it with the 12 M. And the 12 M is actually microns versus grit. So, my 12M lap is the equivalent of a 1500 grit lap, if there was such a thing. So it's even smoother. So I think I should be able to go straight to polish. Um, I'll give it a try with my tin lap and cerium oxide. So I took my bottle of cerium oxide, shook it up, I've let it set, and now I'll spray my tin lap, start it rotating, and spray it with my cerium oxide. I'll use a slow, slow drip of water from my drip tank and see how that works. I've 
finished polishing the first row of the crown, a 42 degree angle, and uh, I could go ahead and go to the next tier and just polish, having gone from the uh, 12M straight to polish, but um, there's, there's a little gap here all the way around, so that means this facet has to be moved down a little bit. And I could do that with the uh, cerium oxide and the polishing lap to move those facets down so they just touch that girdle, just meet it in, which is the whole point of meet point faceting. But I think I'll go ahead and go to the 8,000 grit diamond on a bat lap. It'll move those facets much quicker and it'll make them smoother, although I had no problem polishing from the 12M polishing from the 3000 grit will be even easier. So I'll go ahead and take my 3000 grit diamond on a bat lap and work on the second and third tiers and then go back and polish them and then we'll be ready to cut and polish the table. I finished polishing the crown of our uh, quartz, our first quartz. So now I'll take it out of the uh, Ultratech machine and I'll finish cutting and polishing the crown of the second quartz and then I'll cut the two tables, one after the other, that way I'll only have to set up for the uh, table cut with the tabling adapter once. I finished polishing the crown of our second uh, quartz using a cerium oxide and a tin lap. Worked out just fine. So now I'll set up to cut the table of both our quartz stones and then we'll be finished. Okay, to set up for cutting our table, the first thing we do on our Altertech machine is to remove this brass screw because our tabling adapter will fit over this and if we leave the screw in, it, it won't fit over the spindle. So we attach the screw to a hole drilled in the Altertech just so it doesn't get lost. It's the only purpose for that hole. Set the uh, dial indicator at 45 degrees and that allows that when we attach the tabling adapter and slide it on to the spindle it's also at 45 degrees so the two 45 degrees will give us the 90 degree angle we need to cut the table so we slide the 45 degree tabling adapter onto the spindle where we remove the bat brass screw and then like I said one one way to make sure okay your, your tabling adapter isn't cutting uh, wrong I mean if it was if it was the left or right um you've got to have it flat otherwise your table won't be flat we've got it set front and back at 45 so we need to just make sure the table's flat and one way people do it is simply by using putting the table adapter itself onto your flattest lap while you're at a 45 degree angle and then tightening these two set screws on your tabling adapter um, or the Altertech gives you a tool which has a wider base to make sure that it's um, flat and doesn't wobble left or right you simply slide the table aligner into your 45 degree table adapter and I turn it sideways uh, uh, like this so that there's more space on the left and uh, covered with the aligner on the left and the right and that assures you that you're not too far left or right, so you'll have a 40 a flat table, front, back, left and right. So once you set the two screws on the 45 degree table adapter, you can then remove the tabling aligner and insert one of the DOPs with our quartz and 
for me, I always set it with the angle going back towards the machine. It doesn't really matter. And I slide it in as far as the, I believe it's a 516, the top part uh, can go in. And then you simply set, tighten the set screw for your top and you're ready to cut the table. Okay, there's not that much to take off of our uh, table of our clear quartz. So I used the 600 uh, grit topper. I only have this far to go. So instead of switching to the uh, 12M at this point, I'm going to switch out my quartz stones and go ahead and take the second stone and use the 600 lap topper lap that's already set up. It's already set up and in place. So I'll go ahead and use my 600 topper and uh, work on this stone. Then, then I will switch to the uh, 12M and at that point I'll probably stay with the same stone, the 12M and then uh, the, the 3000 and then polishing. I won't switch out again because I don't want even small differences in position to cause a problem with the table. And then I'll switch back to the other stone and go through with the 12M, the 3000 grit on the bat lap and the, uh, the tin with the serum oxide. So it just saves a little bit of time with uh, changing laps by using cutting these two stones. I finished polishing the table on our two pieces of quartz with our basic standard round brilliant design. And uh, again, that's why I like cutting two stones, more than one stone at the same time, is because you, you get some kind of efficiencies, uh, saving time uh, with the second one over the first. So it's just uh, kind of a little bonus that the time spent on the second one is a lot less than the first one. So for me, it's, I like cutting two stones at one time. So let's go ahead and uh, remove the two-part epoxy and weigh them and measure them and send them off to Bopi. This video is designed for very new gem cutters or people looking at becoming gem cutters as the standard round brilliant or SRB design is very often the first stone that new gem cutters are tasked to cut. And in this video, I also explain uh, why we can't cut diamonds. We can cut all the other gemstones out there, all the other natural gemstones in the world, but not diamonds. And to point out that the pioneer in our field, Nick Michaelitis, who built a machine and a lap just so he could cut and facet a diamond. I want to thank Nick for giving me some pointers on mixing my cerium oxide into a spray bottle and it's working out great. And I also show in the video uh, how I'm now testing out DevCon uh, two-part epoxy instead of the JB Weld which I used for a couple of years. And over the next months I'll decide if there any big difference between the two or if I like one better than the other and I'll let you know. So again a big thanks to Nick and for everyone happy faceting.